So second question. Um, so basically each of the points is A or B, right? So if it's A, then it's the left hand and uh, B is the right hand. So let's see, which, which hand is it? Is it a randomly sampled flight delay or is it an average of flight delays? So basically notice the S's or lack of S's. Let's say. So A is left. I also have to figure out left and right again. Um, and B is right. So the right hands have it. Okay. So this B is another way of saying a sample, right? So it's an average of a set of flight delays. So in you know, kind of in this case, right? It's the we we're talking about the gold histogram. So therefore, B is the average of 900 flights. Okay, A would be correct if we chose if we had a histogram in there that was a sample size of one. Okay, so this is a randomly sampled. One, so out of our 13,825, I can't believe I'm sorry to memorize that number. Um, it's as if we just pop one out of there, right? And we use that as our input, which is the same as a sample size of one. Whereas this one is, let's choose 900 with replacement, right? Uh, so we get a really big number of possible options. Um, and then we take an average of that and we call that uh, and, and that's what each of those points is, right? All right. And then here is kind of the written explanation. Um, just trying to see if there was anything I didn't say. Yeah, and so, you know, so the first, the gold one is basically 10,000 points, each point being uh, a block of 900 elements, right? And then the second, the blue histogram is again, 10,000 points of 400 samples. Uh, they are both roughly bell-shaped, but with the larger the sample size, the narrower the belt. So more accuracy ensues. So going back here, which seems to have a lot more, let me just see if I, I need to catch up to where I am. Um, all right, so now we kind of want to start talking about some of the standard di distribution information. So we look at the standard di distribution size of the samples where we took uh, sample size of 100, uh, and the samples where we took a sample size of 400. Um, so what do you notice about the difference between those two numbers for the sample, uh, for the dis uh, standard distribution size? What's the really obvious difference between kind of the one on the left and the one on the right? Well, it has a lower standard deviation, right? which by extension means lower uh, variation. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about, okay, what's the relationship between some of these things, okay? So In other words, as you said, right, 1.9 is smaller uh, than, you know, 3.9, but is there a way we can figure out how much smaller or can we predict how much smaller it's going to be? And, you know, teaser, right, like, yes, there is, in fact. Okay, so the first thing we start to do, um, and I'm not sure we're going to get to the whole thing today, but uh, what we'll do is say, let's try dividing those two things from each other to figure out kind of where 
uh, their relationship, what their relationship is, you know, uh, a lot of times division can be used that way. Um, and so we see that when we divide uh, those two standard deviations, we get just right around two. Um, and what's kind of neat is that if we take the square root of the 400 divided by 100, what do you think we're going to get? Yeah, somebody, somebody said two. I couldn't tell. Um, but yeah, so right around two. So this, obviously, because we're doing samples here, this is not going to be perfect, right? But we know that it's around two. And so we know that um, we're going to get whatever it is. Like, what is it like 2x more accuracy? Is that, am I saying that right? Um, so it's like 2x more accuracy when we go from 100 to 400. I may be, I may be saying that wrong. Um, but if we kind of go a little bit further, I think it starts to get clearer. Um, so what we want to do is like, can we start to look at, you know, here's like 450 and 900. What's their relationship going to be? Okay. Um, and it's going to take a minute because it's going to have to run um, because we're going to do 10,450 uh, samples. Um, and we can see that it's getting better, right? Um, so, like, or, or these two are closer together, right? This one is, you know, 900, it's 1.45. And so, if we can kind of follow along from there, we can then take the square root of the calculation. And assuming I copy and paste correctly, um, we can see we can actually predict that. That's really quite far off, actually. Um, like maybe I have a typo or something. Um, it's both four, right? Well, yeah, it's just. 1.45 and 1.41. Um, I expected them to come out to be closer. Um, so, you know, we can run this again. You know, maybe we just got a very skewed sample set, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but like in my prior experiments, they were closer. That's why I was a little surprised. Um, so the question is, if we now look at 100 versus 900, is that going to be like, is that going to show a kind of a bigger jump or a smaller jump than 450 to 900? Right, it's going to be a bigger jump, right? Because the, the 100 is much less accurate, right? And the 900 is quite a bit more accurate. The distance between those, and that's what we're going to talk about here, is um, you know quite a bit more. So as a result, we're going to expect that to be a bigger difference. Um, and as you can see, yeah. So that's right around three. So we can do the square root. And so what we can see here, right, is that we don't actually have to do this to figure out the three, right? We can just take the sample sizes that we want, and we know that, uh, like, that 900 will be, or I'm sorry, 100 will be a third or two third, wait, a third less accurate than the 900. Um, so, if you kind of start to look at, or you know, I tried to kind of show you the math here because I think it's pretty straightforward, but basically, you take your original. Um, or you take the kind of larger sample size, right? And the smaller one, you divide those, right? You get nine over one, which is uh, nine, right? And then take the square root of nine, and that's three. So that means we've got one third smaller spread than the hundred sample size. So it's like two thirds more accurate, I guess, is kind of sort of the right way to say it. Um, but the, the idea, right, is that the difference between the spread on the bottom x-axis 
between the 100 sample size and the 900 is going to be one will be one the 900 will be one third the size of the of the wider one does that make sense it's like i don't know why i find it very hard to articulate but it's really hard for me to say but that's what you're looking for is right we're looking to go in closer so we're trying to make that spread smaller and so we know we can calculate it by saying um, or by guessing with the square root up there we can say okay so how much smaller will it be well we know it'll be a third smaller uh spread overall um, and we can prove it in in running tests at least anecdotally or empirically by actually comparing our sample sets um, and we see that this is also a three so that's a third less okay so basically you imagine like so this value here is this one you know one divided by whatever number you get here or one divided by that number there all right All right. And then, oh, I kind of jumped the gun on the next thing, but that's all right. So just kind of looking at the 100 again, which shouldn't take very long. Yeah, okay. So, so what we want to know is how big is the standard deviation here, right? Um, and so, the, standard deviation of this is going to be uh, like just shy of four, right, which is way better than the 39 that we have on the general population. Okay, but still that's only a sample size of 100. So that's why our, our histogram is so kind of choppy looking and not a nice bell curve. Um, and then we talked about this already a little bit. Um, what if the sample size is one? Well, the sample size is one is the same as the population standard deviation. Um, and then, yeah, and then the sample size of 100. Um, yeah, basically, I, I talked about it out of order of displaying it. Um, but so now we can kind of do that similar calculation by looking at the actual Am I supposed to go back to the slides yet? No. Okay. Um, so basically, the we kind of get this this number ten, right? Is that that's going to be our kind of difference in standard deviation? So what we can do. Oops. This should be. So we can start to use that. Sorry, let me. I seem to have. Oh, okay. So so then we want to run like a four hundred, okay? And then, but what we want to know is what's kind of what is this new standard deviation going to be, right? We we know that the old one with the 100 was 3.9, okay? But if we look at this 10 number, we can start to look at when we calculate the square roots, which I'll do in a second. Ah. I probably should have typed all of this, but. So if we look at the square root of the difference, right? So now the 400 versus the 100, we know it's about, it's two. So that also gives us a useful piece of information in that anybody have a guess as to what the new standard deviation would be, will be, or the new uh, relationship between the two standard deviations. So if we take the standard deviation of now our sample size of 400 of, what are those, is that 1.99? And we divide our original population standard deviation and we know that the change that we made between the 100 and the 400 is a two. Anybody have a guess if our old one is 10, what this new value will be? Correct 
around 20 exactly so and to say 19 yeah so you know just shy of 20. so basically that gives us another way of looking at those estimations and the relationship between running a sample size of 100 versus a sample size of 400 you know ad infinitum um because now we're starting to see uh we're getting more and more information about what the sample size should be in order to get an accurate estimate if we want to look at you know if we go back to talking about confidence intervals right we want to be within that you know call it 95 percent of the possible range this is starting to hint at the kinds of sample size that we want so and then just by way of Oh yeah, and so you know, and, and we're gonna we're gonna cheat later, right? But so you know, interestingly enough, right, the square root of four hundred is also twenty. Um, so then, if we look at six twenty five, we eventually um, will get a standard deviation for the samples the 625 samples does anybody know why 625 is the number chosen here take a wild guess given the last command i ran before this one all right we'll, we'll look at it from a different perspective um so as i say for this one the sample is 1.59 so if we do that calc again does anybody have a guess as to what that value is going to be? Exactly. So right around 25. Okay. And because, or not because, but it is also true that the square root of 20 of 625 is 25. Um, it's kind of a, you know, they mathematically both hold, but it's not really like a causal relationship, right? Um, so again, we're starting to be able to predict more and more information about our bell curve uh, that works. Um, sorry, scrolling weirdly. And so let's see. I feel like I've talked about a bunch of this already. Um, yeah, so let's look at those slides, I think. Yeah, okay. So the variability of the sample average, the distribution of all possible sample averages of a given size is called the distribution of the sample average, and we can approximate it by empirical distribution. So by the, um, Oh my God, I just blanked. What's CLT? Central limit theorem? Yes. I'm like common law. No, that's not right. Uh, what? Uh, central limit theorem. Uh, it's roughly normal. So the center will be the population average, and then the standard deviation will be the population uh, standard deviation divided by uh, the square root of the sample size. And what we're going to probably, I think we're going to talk about next time is how do we figure out this population uh, uh, standard deviation? Like, what, do, what are we going to put in this box, right? Because we don't know this answer in the real world, right, versus our samples. So I think we'll talk about that next time. Um, but as you can see, we're starting to get much better information about how we choose the sample sizes. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to kind of point out is that we start to get really useful information when we increase the size or the number of the iterations, right? So if we start off, this is a, a sample size of 400, but we're only doing 10 iterations, okay? That looks nothing like our normal distribution, right? Um, but our 400, right, was, was kind of okay and not great. But so as we increase it, as you would probably expect, because we've talked about this before, it's getting closer. So that was a hundred. And now this is a thousand, right? 
And then we already saw 10,000, but we'll look at it again, assuming it doesn't take too long. Um, but as we increase the number of iterations, uh, kind of all those, uh, you know, kind of variables on the quality of our estimate is also improving, right? So we want to know how big that population is, and we're going to use that information more when we're trying to figure out um, the population standard deviation. Um, and so this is the one I didn't want to run in class um, because it's 100,000 and it takes a bit, like two minutes, maybe more. Um, but as you can see, right, this is looking very much like the normal bell curve, yet we only have 400 sample size. So from a performance perspective, sometimes we might want to think about like, you know, do, is it easier or better, right, to take 400, 100,000 times or 900, 10,000 times, if we're getting roughly the same uh, kind of statistics out of it. We're getting, um, you know, the standard deviation is about 1.9, uh, which I think is about what we were getting before from the 900 sample set. Um, and more on this subject next time. All right, any questions? So basically what we're trying to build up to, right, is like ways that we can figure out, right, be, with some accuracy, the right choices for our sample size and iteration count to get us to valuable um, estimates instead of garbage estimates. Right now we've been mostly kind of just doing it by you know, hook or by crook, as they used to say. Um, but basically, we're just taking a swing at a number and hoping it comes out right. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to have some mathematical ways of saying, this is the number we should choose, or at least at least get some sort of range, right? We don't, you know, uh, we don't even need to necessarily be completely accurate. We want to just have some sort of idea that, you know, it's not 10 and it's not 10 million, right? Maybe it's a little bit closer than that, but the idea is that we can get to good numbers for the the sample size and the iteration count so that we get good answers. And we've already talked about how we measure it kind of on the other side of like, did the output we got give us a good answer or not? That's what kind of the confidence interval stuff tells us. Um, but, you know, rather than having to blindly guess in the dark and keep trying it, we don't want to do that either. So we want to try to find some ways that we can expect to get a good confidence interval. All right, any questions? All good? All right, then just, I always put the announcement slide up at the end as well. Um, projects due on Tuesday uh, and course uh, assistant up it, uh, application is up and don't forget you have a homework this week um discussion section is just a normal lab right this week yeah so um you know if you have any questions bring that up there too um the lab i think is about this i think i think I we're a little bit ahead actually okay all right yeah, i think last week something this week Okay, uh, my accuracy of time is also bad. Um, all right, thanks everybody.